Habakkuk or Habakkuk, however you want to pronounce it. Just 15 minutes ago, I put on D2L the second exam, so it'll be due a week from today. Should be the right date. A week from today is October 31st. Um, I'm not going to go over the stuff at the top. It's pretty much the same as on the previous exam, only this one, it's not a word count, it's a page count. Two to three full pages. So you have to have at least one, two full pages. Okay? Don't go over onto a fourth page. So two pages to three pages. You can finish at two pages in one line on the third page. That's fine. Does not include works cited. Okay? But I do want to um, briefly talk about um, the topics. Okay? So, I can't read that that way. Um, first topic. All of these books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, in one way or another deal with or express wisdom, the knowledge gained through long experience of life. That's kind of the everyday standard definition of wisdom. You're going to notice each question is going to ask you to deal with that a little bit differently. Looking at the book of Job, what is the wisdom that Job gains by the end of the book that he lacked at the beginning of the book? Okay. How does he gain that wisdom? In your response, pay careful attention to Job's, that is the person, not the book. Conclusion in chapter 42. What does Job say in chapter 42? What do his final words tell us about what he has learned? In your response, include at least three substantive 10 to 30 words, quotations, that are, here's something I've added to this little comment, relevant to the topic and to your thesis. Um, Again, I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I had many problems with your first papers in terms of your quotations being relevant. But man, some of my other classes, I had the weirdest quotations for whatever the topic was. It was like something totally oblivious um, or unrelated to the topic. So just make sure the quotations you use are spot on. Okay, number two. You just choose one of these, obviously. Uh, the Psalms include wisdom literature, but also much more. In them we read of the varied experiences of human nature, such as joy, sadness, anger, love, fear, hope, despair. Okay. Looking at the varied experiences recounted by David in his Psalms, so just look at the Psalms of David. They each one begin a Psalm of David. Okay. Um, and I put the numbers of the Psalms of David at the top of the book. The first 41 are all by David, as an example. Um, how does the quote-unquote biblically wise person, that is, not the person who is knowledgeable about the Bible, but the person who is wise according to the Bible, respond to all the experiences of one's life, the good, the bad, the ugly? That is, what does, quote, biblical wisdom, unquote, teach should be about, teach us about living in this world with all its ups and downs. You might consider read carefully, especially Psalms 34, 40, 51, 88, 90, 103, and 104. Except I just now realized I don't think all of those are by David. Um, anyways. In your response, include at least, again, three substantive quotations. Make sure that they are relevant, okay? 34, 40, and 51 are all by David. It's when I typed those out, I didn't even think about looking to make sure that 88, 90, and 103 to 104 are. So, uh, number three, Proverbs is a book entirely of wisdom. Some of it inferred, some of it distilled into literal proverbial sayings. Okay. Um, taking the book as a whole, what does it say or suggest wisdom is? Taking the book as a whole. Or to put it another way, define wisdom according to the book of Proverbs. Three substantive quotations, etc. Four, Ecclesiastes. So notice we've just gone in the order in which we've read them. Four, Ecclesiastes in one sense, I think I may be wrong. If you think I'm wrong, say so and show me why. 
because I, I probably am, um, may be seen as the conclusion to the wisdom literature and that it not only comes after all the others, but because it also kind of sums it all up. Okay? Again, I may be wrong. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. I should have that in quotation marks, but I don't. Um, what does that mean, especially in the context of Ecclesiastes, but also in the context of from Job to Ecclesiastes? Okay. How does this book express the idea of wisdom? Or what is wisdom according to the book of Ecclesiastes? The wise person, according to the book, ultimately says what about all of life's experiences? Or, put another way, what ultimately is of the utmost importance in this life? Utmost, the greatest. Okay, so according to Ecclesiastes, what's of the greatest importance in this life? Three quotations, etc. Okay, last one. Bit more general, but allows you to think more about all four books. Discuss the idea slash theme of wisdom in all four of these books. What ultimately do they say comprises or defines wisdom? In your response, include at least one substantive quotation from each book. Again, that are relevant to the topic and or your specific thesis. And then it also includes this, okay? By the way, nobody in this class did that. I have two from my last class that I'm turning in tonight that did. They turned in a front page that looked exactly like this, with the exception of the title was different, and they did not include blah, blah, blah. I had two students who turned in a paper that had this information for their respective class had a title, and then the rest of it was blank. And then you turn over to the second page, and the paper started. Okay? It, it means start the paper. Blah, blah, blah means that's where you start your paper. I, I didn't think I should have to explain that, but apparently I did. Um, okay. Exit. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that's clear. If it's not, email me. Whenever you're in doubt about it, anything related to the class, email me. If you're not sure how to cite something, shoot me a brief email. I will show you exactly how to cite it, which usually means you can copy it directly from the email and paste it into um, your essay. Okay, lights are not on all the way. Lights. There we go. All right, let's see here. We're going to put this. Jonah and Habakkuk. These are two of what are called, if you remember from the second day of class, I think, the minor prophets. There are 12 of them. They're not minor because they're unimportant. They're not minor because they are less importance than the quote-unquote major prophets. You know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah. Those are the major prophets. They're minor in the sense that they are smaller. They're shorter. The, the books are, are much shorter than are the others. Right? They're largely dealing with the same issues as are in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Okay? Almost, yeah, I'm going to say almost, because I am not 100% sure. Almost all of the prophets are dealing, partially at least, with the destruction of Jerusalem, and or Israel slash Judah. Israel slash Judah are not synonyms. They're not the same thing. Israel is the tribe and the kingdom of Israel. Judah is the tribe and the kingdom of Judah. 
Okay? So the destruction of Jerusalem and one of these, or the destruction of Jerusalem or one of these. They usually have something to do with either the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, or the Assyrians. Okay? Who are the ones doing the destroying? Okay? Now, in talking about those, get that marker that works a little better. In talking about those, they are, again, almost all of them, I can say, because I'm 99% sure it is all of them, but I'm going to hedge my bets just a little bit. They are what's called eschatological. That is, they deal with the what's called the eschaton. The end. Jump to Revelation. Revelation is an eschatological book. It's about the end times, right? Okay. So they look at this kind of as a prefiguring, foreshadowing, etc., of this. Or that's one way of looking at it. Or they look at this as this. Because obviously, if your city is being destroyed in your time, it is what? It is the end times for you. Okay. And in almost every instance of dealing with that, what's the cause? You could say that the cause is... is twofold or has two causes one kind of um, how do I want to put this one kind of um, clearly visible cause and one unseen cause okay the clearly visible cause is usually anybody have an idea Kind of goes back to what we've talked about almost since the beginning of class. That we, we see this pattern. What what is judges? What's the pattern that we see in judges? Fall, repent. Fall, repent, blessing, fall, repent. Well, this, this is caused by Jerusalem and or Israel and Judah, meaning the people in those places falling. Okay. The end, so the first cause is the people messing up. Okay. The second cause is God. So what does God do? So the people mess up. And what does God do? He looks at Jerusalem slash Israel slash Judah and does what? He brings in the Babylonians. He brings in the Medes. He brings in the Persians. He brings in the Assyrians. Just like, back to the book of Judges, you have the Israelites largely against who? Throughout the book of Judges. Who's their number one enemy, per se? The Philistines. They keep going back and forth. Okay? So, why? What purpose do the Philistines serve in the story of Judges? They're the antagonist, right? The Israelites are the protagonists. They're the people we're supposed to identify with, the people we empathize with, etc. And the Philistines are brought in to kind of teach them a lesson. Okay? So, the Babylonians are brought in by God to do what? Smack them upside the head. Get them to see reality. And they go, oops, sorry. Things get calmed down a little bit. And then they make a mistake again. Or, let me rephrase that. They sin again. Because making a mistake is not the same as sin. 
and they fall away, and somebody else is brought in. They return, they fall away, somebody else. Genesis, all the way through Malachi. That is the ultimate cycle you see repeated all throughout. But in the prophets, both the four major prophets and these minor prophets, and, and bear in mind, Moses is a prophet, Samuel is a prophet, okay? They're just not <coughs> included usually among the prophets. Those are the writings, etc. Samuel's the writings, Moses is the Pentateuch and such. The prophets are doing what? The prophets are kind of like in the book of Job, pulling the curtain back. So we see what? We see God's hand involved in everything. Because... Take the first two chapters of Job out and take the last two, just about, three chapters of Job out, and what do we see? Take the first two chapters, the council in heaven, okay, and take the last two or three chapters where God comes and responds to Job. Take those two out of the book of Job, book of Job. And what are you left with? What, what does the book of Job then suggest or say about life? It sucks, right? It makes absolutely no sense. Bad things happen, period. It doesn't even suggest bad things happen, deal with it. It suggests bad things happen. And guess what? More bad things are going to happen, and more bad things are going to happen, and more bad things, and it just gets worse. Every day is worse than the day that comes before. Not a way to live life, right? How many want to go on in a life that's that way? Not many would, okay? So you get the beginning, the prologue, and the conclusion that say essentially what? There's a reason. It, it does make sense, okay? That's what the prophets are largely doing. They're kind of telling the people of Israel slash Judah slash Jerusalem, here's why this is happening. We have to straighten up. We have to get our act together. But then you get a book like Jonah. What does Jonah say about Jerusalem, Israel, or Judah? Literally nothing, right? It has nothing to do with any of those places. It has everything to do with what place? Right. Down here, the Assyrians. Right? Nineveh was a major city in, in um, Assyria, okay? So what do we see in this in this very, very brief prophecy. One of the shortest books in the in the entire Bible, okay, in the Orthodox Church on what's called Great and Holy Saturday, the Saturday before Easter, this thing is almost read in its entirety, publicly. That is one person, it's usually me, stands up and reads the entire book. We say the reading is from the book of Jonah. It should be, the reading is the book of Jonah, because literally do almost the entire thing. So, Let's look at how Jonah opens. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, etc. Now, Jonah is mentioned elsewhere in your footnote. I was looking at another version of the Bible earlier. He's mentioned in Daniel and where else? One of it's not included in the introduction. Why is that not included? I mentioned in Daniel and I want to say one of the Samuels. Either one of the Samuels or one of the Kings books. Okay? So we get this, you know, who he is, and we're told the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, if you turn for just a moment to... Habakkuk, 
on page 1136, the oracle of God, okay? And then if you were to turn to, um, no, not turn to Zechariah, just those two. The word of the Lord is often portrayed, or, or let me put it this way. The, the prophet who receives the word of the Lord, it usually comes, it's usually described as a burden. That is, this person is impelled to speak. He can't stop himself. Okay? Now, what's another meaning of the word burden, though? If you're carrying a burden, what is it? It's a load, right? It's not easy. None of the prophets, not one of them, has an easy life. Right? Every one of them deals with what from the people he is speaking to? Rejection. Yeah. Rejection. Why? Don't tell me what God wants. Don't tell me what God's planning. Think of Ecclesiastes. Because I want to eat, drink, and be merry. I want to enjoy my pleasure right here, right now in life. And the prophets kind of go, you should stop that. You should, you know, pay attention to these larger issues, etc. So, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and what does it say to him? Notice here, the word of the Lord isn't coming to Jonah to speak this directly to the people. It comes to him and it says to him, go to Nineveh. And do what? Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Cry just means proclaim. Against it kind of means he's going to go to Nineveh and say, damn you, Nineveh. May you go to hell, etc. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah does what? He doesn't go to Nineveh. He goes the opposite direction. Nineveh's in the east. I don't know which way it would be. Nineveh's in the east. Tarshish is over on the coast of the Mediterranean. So he goes as far away from Nineveh as he can. Story-wise, thinking, thinking of this as literature, that's our opening conflict. That's our opening complication. God tells you to do something and you do the opposite. What do you know is going to hammer, uh, happen? The hammer is going to fall. God's going to kind of eh, turn your direction around. So he flees to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He tries to flee from God. Now, what, based at least, let's say, just on the Psalms, What's pretty clear about the quote-unquote presence of the Lord? Where is it? What does David say? Multiple psalms when he's trying to flee from God. I can't. Even if I go down to Sheol, he says, thou art there. I go here, thou art there. I go there, thou art there. I try to flee, you are. Okay, so I can't run away from you. Jonah tries. So he goes down to Joppa, cities that still exist, by the way. Tarshish is where Saul, later Paul, is from. Joppa, still a city in northern Israel on the coast. And he finds a ship. He pays the fare. He goes on board. Okay. Again, trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. But God does what? Big old storm. Okay. Ship threatened to break up. The mariners are afraid. Each one cries out to his or her own God. They throw all the stuff that they're carrying in the ship to Tarshish. That is, this is a loaded, a, a laden vessel carrying goods. They throw all the money producing goods overboard. Not enough. Jonah, meanwhile, is down sound asleep in the in inner part of the boat. Any biblical parallels anywhere? Yeah. Christ in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Big old storm. He's 
Meanwhile, the disciples are all, you know, going crazy. Okay, so the captain comes, wakes him up, wakes him up. What do you mean? Call upon your God. Why? Why does he tell Jonah, call upon your God? Think story-wise. Ours aren't doing any good. I mean, obviously, they've all been, quote-unquote, calling to, praying to their gods, and the storm's still raging. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us. So they cast lots to figure out who's the cause. Very ancient idea. Not just biblical. You see it in ancient Greek society, ancient Roman society. This idea of we're going to let the gods decide by casting lots. And whoever's the lot is, that's what the god slash fate determine is the problem. And it's Jonah. Why did the lot single out you? And what does Jonah do? Notice what could he do here? Very easily. He could lie. But he doesn't. He tells them the truth. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Okay. By saying, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land, he's saying, I fear the God who is above all other gods. Because in the area at this time, in the near Middle East, you had a multiplicity of gods. You had gods of trees and gods of water and gods of rocks and gods of stones, gods of earth, gods of the sky. But you didn't have, except for in the Hebrew religion, one God who does it all, okay? He says, that one. <laughs> That's the one I serve. And they're afraid. What have you done? By asking them, what have you done, they're saying, what have you done to that God? Why is he angry? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. So when he bought his ticket, he said, Let's go fast. I'm trying to flee from God. They probably thought when he said that, what? Oh, he's trying to flee from this kind of God. Okay? Like a little God. Now they realize, oh no, he's different God. And so they say, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? Notice they ask him that. They don't go back to their gods. What should we do with this one who serves the God of heaven and earth? They ask him. They're expecting him, because of whom he says he serves, to answer them truthfully. Throw me overboard. Kill me. That's what he's really saying. Kill me. It's because of me this tempest has come upon you. So, you throw me overboard, and the sea will go calm. You'll all be saved. But, what do they do? They don't throw them overboard. They row harder and harder, trying to get to a harbor. But the harder they row, the sea grows more and more tempestuous. So they cry out to the Lord, and they say, Let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not on us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Notice the causes, Jonah and God. So they cry out before they throw him overboard. Another parallel. I am clean of this man's death, Pilate. His death not be on me. Okay? So they throw him overboard. And it's like the minute he hits the water, the storm calms. And then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Kind of interesting, they offered a sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? Is it what eeny, meeny, miny, mo? You know, mo gets sacrificed, or is it some other kind of sacrifice? Anyways, then we get what? 
we get the thing for which the prophecy of Jonah is most well known. See, most people, if you mention Jonah, they'll say what? In the whale. They won't say, Nineveh, repent. And the people of Nineveh, that part of the story is totally lost. This part of the story is remembered. Why? Because that can't really happen. That's total fantasy. Fish don't swallow people. So, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, which Christ will later use as an image for what's going to happen to him before the crucifixion. He says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be in the earth, etc., etc. So, inside the belly of the fish, Jonah prays. And notice it's printed as a poem. It's a song that Jonah sings. I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and thou didst hear my voice. Two, two. Okay? This psalm of thanksgiving, reading a footnote, instead of an expected petition for help, may originally have been independent of the prose narrative. It now serves to express Jonah's thanks for his deliverance. Okay? Compare it, by the way, with, notice verse 2 in the footnote has beside it, Psalms 18.6, 120.1. Because 18.6 is almost word for word what is said in Psalm 2. Okay? For thou didst cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood was round about me. All thy waves and thy billows passed over me. David uses that exact same language, only here waves and billows are meant literally. In David, they're meant metaphorically. He means the waves of being slapped by God, so to speak. Then I said, I am cast out from thy presence. How shall I again look upon thy holy temple? The water closed in over me. The deep was right about me. Weeds were wrapped about my head like seaweed. At the roots of the mountains I went down to the land, whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet thou didst bring up my life. And there's that idea again that we've talked about, the pit. Okay? Again, the pit, when it's referred to from Genesis to Revelation, is never good. It is always death. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to me into thy holy temple. Those who paid the guard, blah, blah, blah. And the whale barfs them up. Chapter 3. The word of the Lord comes again. Notice, it's not the same word. That is, it's not merely, and Jonah remembered the word of the Lord. It's like, God reaches out and says, all right, I'm going to tell you again, go to Nineveh, to that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. Ah, notice the difference between 3-2 and 1-2. 1-2, go to Nineveh and cry against it. That's kind of like, go to Nineveh and blast it with your words. Accuse it. 3-2, it says what? Proclaim to it the message that I tell you. 1-2 didn't say anything about the message that I tell you. So Jonah goes. Why? Why does he go now when he didn't go before? He's probably still wiping the fish stuff off of him. Okay? Let's accept it literally for the moment. So he goes, and we're told Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. That means, excavate, your footnote, excavations have revealed a city about three miles in length and somewhat less than one and a half miles wide. The message of the story, not the size of the city, is of primary import. But for the time frame that Jonah is supposed to have lived, Okay. Depending upon which biblical scholar you read, any time between about 
seven to eight hundred BC to six hundred BC. A three mile long city, that's pretty big. Bigger than Jerusalem, okay? Way bigger than Jerusalem. So he goes into the city. And we're told, he tells them. He goes a day's journey into the city. That probably means he goes into the middle of the city. So he stands in the middle of the city and cries out, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Why 40 days? Well, there's all kinds of 40s throughout the Bible. Moses spends 40 days on Mount Sinai. The Israelites spend 40 years in the desert and such. Jesus spends 40 days in the desert for his temptation. So 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And what happens? The people of Nineveh believed God. See, it's implied. Jonah doesn't think they're going to listen. Jonah doesn't think this is going to work. He thinks God sent him on a fool's errand, essentially. That's one of the things that's implied. The other thing that's not as much implied as clearly suggested is Job, uh, not Job, Jonah doesn't want them to repent. Keep in mind, the Ninevites are Assyrians. They are the Hebrews' kind of natural born enemies. Okay? They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. From the king to the lowest slave. Tidings reached the king of Nineveh. He arose, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes. He made proclamation throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. And here's his proclamation. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Let man and beast be... So you're going to cover your cattle... Cover your, if you have horses, cover your camels, your donkeys, etc., with sackcloth. And let them cry mightily to God. Yea, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence which is in his hands. Okay? So you got your footnote, 5 through 10. Jonah is successful in spite of himself. Sackcloth and ashes, traditional signs of mourning and repentance. Okay? Notice the pagan king sets a better example than Jonah. God comes to Jonah, tells him what to do, and Jonah flees and doesn't do it. God comes to the pagan king, and he falls down on his face and worships. Immediately, first time, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he had said he would do to them. Repented, what that word literally mean? He turns around, okay? And he did not do it. He didn't bring fire and destruction upon them. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Why? He didn't think they deserved to be saved. Yeah. And come on, God, you said you were going to do this. What's it tell us? God changes his mind? Not necessarily. It shows mercy. Who are these people after all? The Ninevites, the Assyrians. Do they know anything, quote unquote, of the God of heaven? Nope. Are they Hebrews? Nope. Are they third cousins eight times removed? Nope. They're not anywhere near related to the Jews. And what's God doing? He's giving them an opportunity for redemption. Showing God is not what? He's not merely what? The God of the Jews. He's the God of everyone. You know, one of the Psalms says, you know, or not one of the Psalms, uh, one of the other, other prophets says, there are other sheep in my pasture of whom you do not know. Well, these are probably some of them. So what does jo uh, Jonah do? I pray thee, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet? This is why he flees. He 
says here, I told you, God, if I go and do what you tell me to do, they're going to turn. They're going to repent. I'm not going to go. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and repentest of evil. Jonah maybe needs to talk to somebody, right? He's got some issues. What are his issues? Rather than see the people change, finish the sentence. He'd rather see them dead. He'd rather see a city of thousands wiped out than a city of thousands worship the God he adores. Why? My God. My God. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of Ashurbanipal, the last of the Assyrian kings. Right? Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Why? Because God's going to accept people not of his nation? Possibly. That could be what Jonah means. That his God is really too big for him. I mean, if you're going to accept people like this, they're not even circumcised. They're not even like us. And he goes out and he sits to the east of the city. He makes a booth for himself there, that is, he erects a little, literally, a little wooden shack. Probably no more than three walls and a roof. And sits under it, into the shade, till he should see what would become of the city. He goes out there and goes, okay, I'm counting down 38 days. Is God going to do it? And the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah. So a tree suddenly sprouts it gives him shade. And Jonah's like, oh man. Because where's Assyria? Where's Nineveh? Modern day, northern Iraq. Kind of hot in the summer. A lot hotter than it is in middle Tennessee. I've driven through the Mojave Desert, Death Valley, uh, from California, a few times in the middle of summer. It's, it's like that. 120, 125 degrees, not out of the normal, okay? Jonah's sitting there, tree comes up, oh, thank you, Lord. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm, which attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a sultry east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die. And said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said, do you well to be angry for the plant? Are you wise for being angry that the plant, what, died? Well, what did the plant have to do before it died? It had to grow, first of all. I, I, yeah, I am, God. I am angry. Angry enough to die. You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night, and perished in a night. What's God doing? The plant is a metaphor. God speaks, notice how? In literary figures. God's the great author. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Boom! End of the prophecy. End of the book. That's God's you know, divine smackdown to, jo to Jonah. I keep wanting to say Job for some reason. Okay? Why? Why does it end that way? What's God's point? What's more important? 120,000 souls or a freaking plant. Job's angry. Jonah's angry because the plant. God's going, get your priorities straight. You should be angry about the people, 
if anything. But now he shouldn't be angry, right? Because now they're what? You could use the Protestant language saved, but not necessarily. But they've turned from their evil, wicked ways. And Job is angry about that. And God says, you didn't plant that city. You didn't water that city. You didn't raise those people. I did. I'm glad that they've turned. The plant, Jonah, is an image. Figure it out. Okay? Now turn from Jonah to Habakkuk. In between Jonah and Habakkuk, you've got Micah and Nahum, which I'm not going to say anything really about, but they're both, they both deal with, you know, um, the problem of the attack of Jerusalem and such. But look at Habakkuk, and let's talk for a moment about the introduction to it. In the present book of Habakkuk, okay, that very introductory statement tells us the editors think something about the book. In the present book implies what? <coughs> There's an older book that's not the one that we have. At least three distinct literary forms can be recognized. The section 1, 2, chapter 1, verse 2, to chapter 2, verse 5, is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. The next section, chapter 2, verses 6 through 20, consists of five woes. In the New Testament, we'll see Christ utter seven woes against the scribes and Pharisees. All right? So five woes against a wicked nation. It's cast, we're told, in classical prophetic style. I mean, God's going to... You know. Chapter 3 is a lengthy poem, similar in structure to the Psalms, and meant, you know, the editors tell us, for liturgical use. Okay? All these three things are connected, we're told, by the common theme of theodicy, that is, justification of the ways of God to man. Justification of the ways of God to man. That's a fancy way of saying, where is God when life sucks? Where is God when life's hard? Where was God on September 12th, 2001? And for all the families personally, directly impacted every day after that. Where's God when it hurts? A uh, Jewish rabbi back in the mid-80s wrote a book. I hate it when it happens. Rabbi Kushner. And he wrote a book, and the title just totally flew out of my mind. Something about, you know, where is God when bad stuff happens? That might be the title. And he wrote it because his son died. His son was pretty young. Pre-teen, if I remember correctly. He's a rabbi. Quote-unquote man of God. And his ultimate answer was, God couldn't do anything about it. God's too small. God's not powerful enough. Because if God were powerful enough, he would have kept my son alive. That's, that's his ultimate answer. Habakkuk's not going to have the same kind of answer, okay? And one of the reasons we're reading Habakkuk and Jonah and the next two, Zechariah and Micah, is because hopefully we'll get to Revelation. Because what we're going to see is Revelation really is the summation, the summary of Genesis all the way to there. That is... As Reichen says in the book you're supposed to be reading that we're not talking about, it's a unified whole. From the beginning to the end, it all points to one main idea. And we're starting now towards the end of the Old Testament to really get that idea driven home. We see elements of it earlier in the Old Testament. Now we're going to start seeing more and more elements of it. Okay? So, justification of the ways of God to man. It now appears as the work of a Hebrew prophet who lived during the height of Babylonian power, most likely in the decade 608 to 598 BC. Okay? Which is just before 
if I remember correctly, the period of the Babylonian exile. That is, Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes the Jews away from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is destroyed. The Temple of Solomon is destroyed. If you go to Jerusalem today, you go to the Wailing Wall, which is the Western Wall, that's the second temple. That's the temple that Nehemiah and Ezra help build when they go back to Jerusalem um, after the Babylonian captivity. Okay, so third paragraph of the introduction. The author is confronting honestly the profoundly disturbing problem of why a just God is, quote, silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he, unquote. Now, if you remember the introduction to Job talks about the same kind of issue. But the introduction to Job essentially says that the answer to Job's real questions ultimately is, well, God's in control and you just have to accept it. That's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, life's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. Deal with it. Well, that's not really what the answer is. To this perennial question, why is it perennial? Because Habakkuk is asking it 600 years before Christ, and we still ask the question today. There's been some earthquakes recently in California, real minor ones, coupling, coupling the San Francisco Bay Area, Last summer, there were a couple of fairly large ones down near the Mojave Desert. Well, there's, there's been a couple of articles out recently where geologists are going, hmm, these, these quakes look like they're kind of connected. And there's this big fault in the Mojave Desert that they've known about for a long time, but they've never seen any, any indication of any movement on it. And it's starting to creep. Slowly. But it's it's constantly creeping. That is, the two fault lines are, are moving like this. And they're kind of going, hmm, is that putting stress because it leads towards the San Andreas? Because if it is, you don't want the San Andreas to suddenly go stack. Because if it does, it'll make the Loma Prieta quake of 1989, it'll make the Riverside quake of a few years after that, and the one a few years before that, it'll make the 1906 quake of San Francisco look like child's play compared to if it really snaps. And so people ask whenever there's a major earthquake, where was God? The answer the prophet receives in response to his question, he directly questions God, is the answer which is eternally valid, your introduction says. God is still sovereign. And in his own way and at the proper time, he'll deal with the wicked. Okay, so... The oracle of God, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now your footnote tells you to look at the beginning of Nahum. If you turn for just a moment to Nahum, an oracle concerning Nineveh. Footnote, title, oracle, literally burden. That's that word I was pointing out earlier. Technical term describing the prophetic word. It shows up in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Malachi. Notice, the prophet saw this word in Amos, Micah, and Habakkuk. It's a vision, etc. So, the oracle of God, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. He didn't hear this. He sees it. It comes as a vision to him. And here's what he says. That is, this is part of what he saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and wilt thou not hear? Or cry to thee violence, and thou wilt not save? What? You can sum up that entire verse, from O Lord to wilt not save. Really to two words. And it's the same two words we're going to see, and this is one of the reasons why we're reading it's the same two words we're going to see in the book of Revelation. Because in the book of Revelation, 
John is going to have his eyes opened, and he will see a vision. And in that vision, he will see heaven. And in heaven, he will see the heavenly throne, and he's going to see an image of the temple, the Old Testament kind of temple. And in that temple, he's going to see under the altar or something. Anybody know what? The souls of the righteous. And the souls of the righteous are going to be doing something. You know what? They're going to cry out, how long? How long? They're waiting. They're saying, come on, God. It's got to be time. Time's got to be up for evil in the world. They're crying out, how long until the end? Well, here he's saying what? How much longer must I cry for help? He's crying for help. Why? Okay. Literally, yeah. Metaphorically, why? What hasn't come? Help. If you're drowning, you're in, a, you're in a pond, you're in a lake, and there's a bunch of people on the shore, do you just go, help, once, and stop, and sit there and try to tread water and hope somebody heard you? No, you keep saying it. How long shall I cry for help and thou wilt not hear? Or cry to thee violence, thou wilt not say. Why dost thou make me see wrongs and look upon trouble? Why do you make me see? Why do you make me endure all this? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arrive, arise. So the... The law is slack and justice never goes forth. The law is slack, it's not paid attention to, and justice never goes forth. Justice isn't practiced. Just saw two, I didn't click on the article, saw headlines just the other day. Two different cases. Um, I think they're both in the north, northeast of two different guys who were charged with crimes, and one was like, uh, one was a college student, accused of rape, convicted, sent to prison, 12 years later, the girl who accused him of rape admitted, wasn't true, didn't happen, spent 12 years in prison. Another one was a guy accused of murder, he spent more than 12 years in prison, and then later on it was determined, wasn't the murderer, okay? Talk about justice never going forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. That's the question. That's what Habakkuk wants to know. What goes? What gives, God? You're God. How come? How does um, some of the Proverbs put it and some of the Psalms put it? Why? Do the evil thrive, and the, or as Billy Joel put it, the good die young? Look at God's response. Look among the nations and see. Okay, stop for a moment, Habakkuk, just shut up for a moment, and look around you. Here's what you'll see. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. That is, if I were to just tell you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe me. So, watch. Watch. For lo, I am rousing the Chaldeans. Kind of mixture of these two. Chaldeans are in southern Iraq. The Syrians are in northern Iraq. Persians are the modern day Iranians. And the Medes are kind of north of modern day Iraq. Okay. I'm rousing the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize habitations not their own. That is, he is instigating the Chaldeans to take nations not their own. Okay, I don't know about you, but if I were Habakkuk and God were to tell me that, I'd still go, what? That's the problem. 
That's what I'm asking you about. Why are the Chaldeans coming and destroying Jerusalem or destroying my people? Well, God's going to explain. But before he does, he does what? Verses 7 and following. He describes for us the Chaldeans. These are not what? These are not Mormon missionaries. They're not nice, calm, peaceful, loving, gentle people. They are dread and terrible. Their justice and dignity proceed from themselves. That is, they practice their own kind of justice. Their justice, God is implying, what? Not my justice. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. The horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle. That is, watch out. They sweep, verse 11, they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men, that is, the Chaldeans are guilty, whose own might is their God. That's why they're guilty. But God says he's doing what with them? He's using them. They have become what? They are a scourge for Jerusalem, for Israel, for the inhabitants of Judah and such. They're God's whip, so to speak, to inflict pain, go back to judges, for what purpose? To bring them back to their senses. Habakkuk, art thou not from everlasting? That is, Habakkuk is speaking. He's asking God another question. O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One. It's not a question. It's presented as a question. It's a rhetorical question. Of course he is from everlasting. We shall not die, O oh Lord. Thou hast ordained them as a judgment. They are a judgment. Whether you agree with them or not, and I don't, I think he's totally off base, Pat Robertson said after 9-11, that was God's judgment. That was God's judgment on America for homosexuality and all, a whole bunch of other kind of stuff. Okay? Personally, I think he was wrong. Thou hast ordained them as a judgment, and thou, a rock, has established them for chastisement. They are our chastisers. Thou who art of pure eyes, and to behold evil, canst not look on wrong. But he does ask this question, why dost thou look on faithless men and art silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Okay, God, so I understand what you're doing. But why do the wicked live and the righteous don't? Answer me that. Help me understand that. For thou makest men like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook, blah, blah, blah. And he finishes, Habakkuk finishes, with chapter 2, verse 1. So he asks God these questions, and he says, All right, I will take my stand to watch and station myself on the tower. He's talking about being a guard on the watchtower, like he's standing on the wall of Jerusalem, and he's going to look out and see when the enemy comes. But here he's not looking for the enemy. He says, God, I'm going to stand on the watchtower, and I'm going to wait for you to answer. Look forth to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. That is, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to wait till God responds, and then I'm going to answer about my complaint to him. It's very similar to Job, right? Because what does Job say? I mean, it takes most of the book of Job for Job to finally say, come here, God, let's pull up a chair and let you and I chat for a while because I got a beef with you. It's not fair what's happening to me. How does God respond again? Uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? 
Where were you when I made the Leviathan? Where were you when I created the camel? Where were you when I thought up snow and frost and hail and the seasons? In other words, God appeals to what? His ultimate wisdom. And Job has to go, sorry. I've only heard of you, but now I've seen. Okay, Now I understand. So God responds to Habakkuk. Like he responds kind of to Job. Only, when I say like, I mean he responds. He doesn't respond in the same manner. He doesn't say, oh, my wisdom is above yours. What's he say? Write the vision. Put it in a book. Here's what you are to write. Make it plain upon tablets so he may run who reads it. Why run? May run where? To the goal or away from what he reads? For still the vision awaits its time. That is, the vision has not come to fruition. The vision has not happened. Well, what's the vision? It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, that is, the vision The end, that's what the vision is of. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. What's it will not delay mean in this context? It will come when? When it's time. So if it doesn't come, God is saying to Habakkuk, in your lifetime, guess what? It wasn't time. Christ says in the Gospels, now is the time come when the Son of Man must be lifted up. In other words, at that point, he's saying, all those other times when the Jews tried to get me, when the scribes tried to get me, when the Pharisees, it wasn't my time. But now the time has come. He knows exactly when. The time is, okay, for the crucifixion. Behold, he whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. He whose soul is not upright in him shall fail. And your gloss tells you, he whose soul, okay, uh, is not upright in him or is puffed up, shall fail. What's that mean? What's it mean to be upright? It means straight, right? Like standing alert. So if the soul isn't standing alert, what's it doing? It's sleeping. I've mentioned the old English poem Beowulf several times. In that homily by Hrothgar that I mentioned, Hrothgar says that the rich powerful ruler, after he is reigned for a while, his conscience will fall asleep. And that is when temptation comes. Okay? Here, the person whose soul is not upright, we're told, it shall fail in him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. So what Habakkuk is being told by God, his faith will do what for the soul? Keep it upright. Well, what's upright mean? What's Habakkuk literally, physically doing at the moment that the vision comes to him? He's standing. Standing out. On alert. On guard. On the watchtower. Okay? What does Christ tell his disciples when he leaves the second time before the ascension? Watch. Be ready. He doesn't mean you can't take a nap. You can't go to sleep. He means always be on the lookout. You don't know when I'm coming. Okay? The righteous shall live by faith. 
Wine is treacherous, the arrogant man shall not abide. His greed is wide as shale, etc., etc. So, shall not these take up their taunt against him in scoffing derision of him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? Right? Look at footnote 4, for verse 4. He whose soul is not, etc. The heart of the matter is that the righteous man who is faithful to God in his word shall live and the unrighteous shall fail. Here the contrast is primarily between Israelites and Chaldeans. That is, it's thought the Israelites are those whose soul is upright. Why? Because they believe in the right God, etc. have faith. And the Chaldeans don't. Okay? Um, go on. So, after the shall not these take up their taunt, etc., etc., we get the first woe. Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own for how long? What's that mean? Heaps up. Gathers up. Takes. Woe to the one who takes what isn't his. And hoards it up. These are all, by the way, describing not a specific individual, not a specific nation or group of people. They are describing a type of nation, if you want, or a type of individual. Person who takes what isn't his. Okay? <clears throat> Look at verse 9. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. Now that could be read as woe to him who uh, rips somebody else off in a trade, in a deal, etc. Twelve. Okay. Woe to him who builds a town with blood. Okay. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink of the cup of his wrath and makes them drunk. So you've got the gloss down at the bottom explaining the woes. These are directed against a nation that plunders peoples. Okay. Obtains gain by violence, builds towns with blood, shamelessly degrades its neighbors, and trusts in idols. Well, I mean, you could look at those literally and say, that, that describes the Chaldeans. You could also say, it describes the Babylonians, it describes the Medes, the Persians, and the Assyrians. It doesn't describe, so to speak, Israel. Though I'm sure some of the Philistines would disagree, and the Edomites and the Amalekites, etc., so, go down to 2.18. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. Notice, the shaper, the maker of the idol, is a teacher of lies. Why? Other than Siri, does the idol ever speak back? No, it doesn't. Does the idol ever help protect it? No, it doesn't. So, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a dumb stone, arise. Why? What if Jonah had prayed to a little, you know, idol he had in his pocket? He'd still be dead. Can this give revelation? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it. 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. All the earth, compared to the Lord, is like a dumb idol. It can't speak. Why? Because it's God that gives breath. It's God that gives voice, ultimately. So, then we get Habakkuk's prayer, <clears throat> which we're not going to read all of. Um, no, take that back. It wrote part of it. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigionoth, which we don't know what that means. O Lord, I have heard the report of thee, and thy work, O Lord, do I fear. I have heard the report of thee, go back just a moment, you don't have to turn to it. Job 42, 5. I had heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees thee. Habakkuk, 
I have heard the report of thee and thy work, O Lord, do I fear thy work, God's action. Well, what's the work that he fears? What has Habakkuk just related to us? The vision. That's the work. In other words, he's heard, now he sees. All right? In the midst of the years, renew it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy, etc., etc. And we get a description of God coming in flesh. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, his glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, there he veiled his power. Before him, when pestilence, plague followed behind. In other words, death. Death came before, death followed after. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. I saw the tents, blah, 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 blah. Go to the, the very end. 16. I hear and my body trembles. It's almost like he's saying, I don't merely hear with my ears. I hear and physically feel. It's like every now and then, you know, you'll be in your car and somebody will pull up next to you and they got those big old bass speakers in the back and it shakes your car. That, I think, is kind of what he's suggesting. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My steps totter beneath me. Why does rottenness st enter into my bones? Is there a gloss down there? No, there's not. Compared to God, everything physical is rottenness to God's, compared to God's purity. My steps totter beneath me. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Notice, I will quietly wait. Why quietly? What's the quietly imply? Faith. Faith. What does Job learn ultimately? You must do what when the crap of this world happens? Patiently endure. He says, I will quietly wait for the trouble to come. He doesn't say, I'm going to rant and rail. Dylan Thomas wrote a poem. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Okay? He says, don't die peacefully. Go kicking and screaming. Habakkuk says, I'm going to wait peacefully. And I know the trouble will come. Though the fig tree do not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. These are images of the end. That is, when the earth doesn't produce, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, when my orchard is wiped out, when my cattle and livestock are destroyed, Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He's saying no matter what happens, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like hind's feet, Psalms, like hind's feet on high places. He makes me tread upon my high places. That is, he makes me tread. Well, earlier he said, my steps Totter beneath me. When? Without faith. Habakkuk ends. The faithful will do what? Endure. Will overcome what happens. Overcome doesn't mean cast it down. Defeat. It means live through. Even though one might die. To live through doesn't just mean physically live. It means endure patiently even to death. Okay? The God, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like hind feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. Okay. 
We'll stop there. Uh, Tuesday, Zechariah and Malachi. I was going to say Michael. Zechariah and Malachi. Zechariah is quite a bit longer than the two that we read today. It's about 14 chapters. Malachi is not very long. Malachi is the last prophetic book and the last book of the Old Testament. About 400 years before the birth of Christ. And then we start the New Testament next week.